as well. And now I'm thrilled to announce Dr. James Choi. James Choi has a PhD in economics from Yale University and is an economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis. In his research, he's asking questions about how social and political institutions promote trust and cooperation, and is especially interested in how these institutions relate to poverty, inequality, and economic development. If you'd like more information on the topic that Dr. Choi is discussing today, please do read his full article, and I'm also going to put a link to that in the chat as well, so you'll have some, some links to follow. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in wel welcoming uh, Dr. James Choi. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's uh, great to have the opportunity to present to this group. Um, let me say this is this, the audience here, I think, is uh, a bit different than the audience that I'm used to presenting to. So um, some of what I say might sound obvious to you. Uh, other things that I have to say might, you might think are, is totally wrong. Um, so in either, e either way, I, I'd love to hear your feedback and to, to, to see what uh, you all have to, th have to have to think about what I have to say. Um, like Natalie said, I'm, I'm going to present some research that I've done uh, on the Amish um, based on an, an article I wrote that was published last year in the Journal of Comparative Economics. Um, I think that, that, that the link is, is, is gated. It's, you need to have a subscription to the journal to see it. So if, if anyone wants to see the article and, and can't get past the, the, the subscription, I'd uh, just send me an email and I'd, I'd be happy to email you the article. Um, let me try and share my screen and see if I can uh, show you my slides. So yeah, so I'm gonna talk about um, uh, this research that I've done on the Amish. Um, I started doing this research back in 2013, so I've been working on it a long time. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, some findings that I've, uh, about the Amish, but to, to begin with, I'm gonna start by talking more generally about how economists think about religion and economic theories of religion. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about how uh, my research on the Amish fits into that. And I, what I'm gonna argue is that um, Studying, uh, understanding the Amish can help us can help inform us about about broader social issues, about about the role of religion in social life, and even about how uh, might give us some ideas for how non-religious people can learn from the Amish, and how even uh, secular society might be able to to be improved by by understanding how Amish society works. Um, so let me start with the standard economic theory of religion. So this is the, the this is the really the only, by far the most influential economic theory of religion. Really in many ways the only theory of religion in economics. And it's called the club goods model of religion. And so the club goods model starts from the observation that many religious communities um, impose rules that restrict uh, what their members can consume. So for example, many religions have rules about what you can eat. I've got here, uh, uh, a halal certification. So in Islam, you're not allowed to eat food that's not halal. In Judaism, of course, you're not allowed to eat food that's not kosher. Uh, many other rules, many other religions have rules of, uh, rules of this kind. Um, a lot of religious communities also restrict what you can wear. So in the bottom left corner here, I've got a picture of some, some Haredi Jews, some ultra-Orthodox Jews. And of course, ultra-Orthodox Jews have very uh, strict restrictions about what kinds of clothes you're allowed to wear. Everyone is supposed to wear the same clothing. You see these kinds of black clothes and hats. And of course, um, if you're familiar with Orthodox Judaism, they also have lots of other rules. This is not, you know, this is not by no means the only rule that um, Orthodox Judaism imposes. And then finally, um, this is a bit less common, but there are some religions that have uh, rules about family, uh, that restrict how you can interact with your families. And that's, this is going to be important for my talk. So in the bottom right corner here, I've got a picture of the Shakers. The Shakers were a uh, religious community that was prominent in 19th century America. And one of the key features of the Shaker religion was that Shakers were required to be celibate. Shakers were not allowed to marry or have children. And so obviously that's a very you know, severe restriction on, on you know, how you can interact with your family members. And in fact, you're not allowed to have a family if you're a Shaker. Um, and so the Club Goods model starts from the question is why do religious communities or many religious communities impose these rules? And of course, if you're religious yourself, you might think, well, the obvious answer is that is spiritual, that the goal of these rules is to get you closer, closer to God, perhaps, or to um, help you uh, help, help help you resist the temptation of the world. And you know, without you know, that, that's certainly one reason for these rules. But I'm an economist, and we economists we care about material things. So, from an economic perspective, the question is, you know, is there some you know not just a spiritual function of these rules, but also a material function of these rules? Do these rules somehow improve the material circumstances? 
of um, members of religious communities. And the club goods model, the, the answer from the club goods model is yes, there is a material function for these rules. And so the way the theory works is it starts from the idea that you've got a budget of resources. So you've got you know, your resource can be either time or money, and you can divide that budget into different categories of spending. So three categories that are going to be important for me are you could, you could spend your resources on yourself, you could spend your resources on your family, or you could spend your resources on the community. So for example, if you have $20 in your pocket, you could say, okay, I'm gonna take this $20 and I'm gonna to go to the store and I'm gonna buy myself a new shirt. That would be spending on yourself. Or you could take that $20 and you could, instead of buying a shirt for yourself, you could buy a new shirt for your son or your daughter, for your children. That would be spending on your family. Or instead of buying you know, a shirt, you could take that $20 and you could donate it to your church or your synagogue or your, your mosque. Um, that would be spending on the community um, if, 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 if the resource is money. Similarly, you could think about time. Um, if you have a free Saturday morning, you could spend that Saturday morning watching TV. That would be spending time on yourself. You could spend that Saturday morning playing with your kids. That would be spending time on your family. Or you could spend that Saturday morning volunteering for your church or volunteering to help out you know, people in need in your community. That would be spending time on the community. And the key idea in economics is that spending on the community, it has benefits not just for me, but for everyone in my community. And because the benefits don't, you know, it's, it's not just me who's benefiting from that spending. Uh, in general, I'm going, the uh, people underinvest in spending on the community. From a, people spend too little, you know, the, the amount that people spend on the community is below what would be optimal from a social perspective. So probably everyone has had, in, in economics, the jargon is called free riding. Um, so probably everyone's had the experience of working on a group project and everyone working on the group project kind of slacks off and doesn't work as hard as they should because the benefits of that group project, you know, accrue to everybody, not just the individual. And so because you, you do, and when you're deciding how hard to work, you don't take into account the benefits that go to other people, you just take into account the benefits for yourself. And so you don't, you, you don't work as hard as you should from a social perspective. And so because people tend to spend less than they should, on, you know, less than would be ideal on, on communities, communities have a reason to want to try and increase the amount that people spend on communities, either, either in terms of time or in terms of money, to want to, to make people do more than they would kind of left to their own devices. And so the idea of the club goods model is that re religious restrictions on private spending, the material function of these res restrictions, is that they increase spending on the community. So for example, let, let's think about money. Suppose that I have $20 in, uh, in my pocket, and I'm thinking about uh, going out to a nice restaurant. Um, but I, and I go to the restaurant, suppose I'm, that I'm Jewish, and I go to the restaurant and I find out that the restaurant's not kosher. And then, so then I think, okay, well, I can't you know, go out to eat at this nice restaurant. Instead, I'm gonna take that money and I'm gonna donate it to my synagogue. Um, or similarly, um, so you've got these restrictions that prevent you from spending, spending resources on yourself because the amount that you spend on yourself goes down, you're likely to spend more on your community. And the same logic works not just for spending on yourself, but also for spending on your family. Um, so I talked about the Shakers. Um, and a key feature of Shaker life is that uh, the Shakers held all of their property in common. So you would have these communities that would work together on a farm. Everyone would you know, milk the cows and bring in the harvest. And because everyone was working communally, there was this big, uh, um, you know, the, the, there, there's a lot of worry about free riding, about people slacking off, people not working hard enough because um, they knew that the, you know, each, in, each individual in the community, their, their effort you know, only contributed a little bit to the success of the community as a whole. And so each individual sort of didn't really, you know, might, might be tempted to just let everyone else carry the burden, to not do too much, too much themselves. And so one of the, really the, an explicit justification for celibacy in the Shaker communities was that you, people, the Shakers were worried that if people had big families, they would spend, you know, they would slack off on their work for the community and they would spend too much time just you know, helping out their own families. And so the idea was, but, but because the Shakers required people to be celibate, they therefore spent less time on their family, they didn't have families, so they spent, obviously they would spend less time on their families. And again, as a result, they would spend more time contributing to their communities um, and more time working for the common good. And so these, according to the club goods model, the point of these religious restrictions is both to reduce time, you know, reduce the resources you spend on yourself and reduce resources you spend on your family to increase the resources you spend on the community. All right, let me tell you, so here's, so that's, that's the club goods model. Um, I should say that the club goods model does not explicitly talk about the difference between self and family. It kind of, in, in that paper, they kind of lump those, those, those things are just considered, considered uh, 
is the same thing, basically. Um, but it, it's helpful to, to distinguish these categories because we can think about an alternative model of religion, um, which I'll think of, which looks like this. So suppose that instead of the community imposing rules as a whole, suppose that the, the community is divided into elderly parents and adult children. And the elderly parents want, you know, like, want to control the adult children's behavior. So in particular, you, your elderly parents might want their adult children to spend less time on themselves and more time not in the community, but on their families. So for example, elderly parents might want their children to spend more time taking care of the parents in their old age. Or similarly, elderly parents might want their adult children to spend more time taking care of the grandchildren, uh, you know, the, 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 the adult children's own children, the young children, the, the, the parents' grandchildren. Um, you know, I uh, probably many people have had the experience. I, you know, I, I have young children. Before I had children, uh, my grandmother spent a lot more. My mom, my grandmother, my mother spent a lot of time uh, nagging me about when I was going to have children. You know, so my 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 mother wanted me to spend more time taking care of children than I was. And if she had had the ability to control my behavior, maybe she would have, you know, made me have, have children earlier than I did. Um, so you can imagine that uh, a, a, a religious community in which the elderly, the, the sort of the old people have uh, political power in the community and they impose restrictions on young people, not to you know, maybe as a byproduct that helps them, it makes the young people spend more on the community, but the primary purpose is not to get uh, young people to spend more time on the community, but to get them to spend more time and more resources on their families. So if you think about the, I, I just told you about two sort of two separate ways of thinking about religion, the club goods model and this alternative model. And the distinction between these two things, I, I like to say is the distinction between what, what I'm gonna call pro-family and anti-family religions. So anti-family religions are the ones described by the club goods model, where the religious community is trying to get you to spend fewer resources on your family in order to, uh, so that you spend more resources on the community. And so examples of this, I talked about the shakers who require you to be celibate, so you spend more time on the community. Um, many cults are notorious for this. So you know, cults are notorious for trying to cut you off from your family so that you'll you know, be more dedicated to the, the cult and the religious community. Um, Anti-family ideas were prominent in early Christianity. That was a, this was a big difference between Christianity and Judaism in, in early Christianity. So if you look at the letters of Paul in the in the New Testament, um, Paul really stresses the virtue of celibacy, and he argues a lot frequently that, that celibacy is a more virtuous state than marriage, a more virtuous state than having children, which is really a big difference between Christianity and Judaism. Christian um, Judaism in Judaism, uh, celibacy is not a virtue. It's uh, it's virtuous to have to be married and to have lots of children. Um, and you see, uh, and so in, in a lot of early Christian communities, so, so Christianity attracted kind of the misfits and the rejects and the people who were not successful in life. And you know, in many cases, those people would leave their biological families and go join Christian communities in the desert um, that were kind of became this kind of substitute family. So again, there's this kind of tension between the family, biological families and the religious community in early Christianity. And you see this, my, you know, my favorite uh, uh, Bible verse about this is, is this verse from Luke. So Jesus said, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. So this really illustrates the idea that there's this tension between family and, and religion. And that if you want to be really dedicated to the religion, you're going to have to be willing to reject your family in some ways. So that's kind of the anti-family religions that are described by the Club Goods model. On the other hand, you know, the, actually most religions, most mainstream religions are pro-family. So they're trying to get you not to, you know, they're, they're trying in, in, in those religions, the religious rules, the point is not to get you to spend you know, fewer resources on, on your family, it's to get you to spend more time and more resources on your family. Um, so again, you know, Judaism is the kind of classic example of this, but I would, you know, I would argue that most mainstream religions are actually pro-family. Um, and so the, the, the Again, the quote here is the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. So here the religion is trying to get you to do more for your parents and to be nicer to your parents and to spend more time and more time and more resources with your parents, not to spend less. All right, so how can we empirically, how can we think about this distinction? So I, I, because, um, what, what's the implication that we should think about here? So because in, in my theory, parents are using religious rules to control their children's behavior, they, the parents, are, there's going to be this conflict between parents and children about whether children remain in the religious community. So the parents are going to want 
children to remain in the religious community so that they're more likely to follow the rules. Whereas the children might, you know, they don't, the children might not want to be controlled and the children might want to leave. And so the parents are going to try and force the, you know, use rules to try and encourage or to force children to remain in the community, even though they might not want to. And so parents are going to be able to impose different kinds of punishments on children who leave in order to influence their behavior and make them stay. So in particular, they can impose communal punishments. So in the Amish, obviously, the, 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 the key communal punishment is the punishment of shunning. Children who leave are going to be shunned by the community. And, and, the, and there are also individual punishments. So a, a, a parent of a child can threaten that uh, if a child leaves the community, the child will be disinherited. Um, and an implication of this is that richer parents, children, richer parents are going to be able to impose more severe punishments. So if your child, if your parent is rich, then being disinherited by that your parent is a more, a more serious punishment than if your parent is poor. And I don't, I don't want you to think about this disinheritance too literally. Right? This is kind of a metaphor. So you can also think just more generally, richer parents are going to have more levers to control their children's behavior. Um, and so because richer parents are going to have more resources to control their children's behavior, and because there's this conflict, I argue, between parents and children about whether the children leave the church, children of richer parents are going to be more likely to remain in the, in the religious community. This, this prediction is a big contrast to the club goods model. So the club, gods, club goods model predicts in contrast that the poor are more likely to join the strict religious communities. This is one of the key predictions of the club goods theory. And the reason is that in the club goods model, the, the main function of the religious community is to provide these kinds of community goods. And it's generally thought that community goods are more beneficial for the poor than for the rich. So for example, one of the most important community provided goods in many religious communities is sort of alms or, or charitable aid to, the, to, to people who are, have experienced uh, uh, bad luck or who have been unsuccessful in life. Um, and obviously that's gonna be more valuable and more important for the poor than for the rich. Um, so, 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 according to the club goods model, it's, it's going to be the poor who are more likely to, to remain in these strict religious communities or to join them in the first place. All right, so let's think about the Amish in the context of these two theories. Um, so what did I do? So my research, I, I digitized um, two editions of the Holmes County Amish Directory, the 1988 and 2010 editions of the Holmes County Amish Directory. Um, I linked those records with property tax records from 1988. So that gives me a measure of how wealthy uh, the families are in, in uh, my sample. So I, in, in particular, my measure of wealth is the value of the, the home of the parents in 1988. So it's not a perfect measure of wealth, but it's the best I can do. Um, I'm going to look at my, my sample is all Amish children who are ages eight to six, between ages eight to 16 in 1988. I chose those ages because that, uh, in 20, 2010, those, um, that means that the, the children were at least 30 in 2010. So they probably had a chance to, by the time you're 30, you've probably decided whether you're going to be a, a, you remain in the church or not. And so I'm going to look at how children's outcomes in 2010 depend on their family characteristics in 1988. So here's the first result. So this is, I, this is not going to be news, news to anyone here. Probably everyone you know, who, who's, who's thought about the Amish has seen something like this, like this before. But this is just... Um, uh, the proportion of children who leave the church by affiliation. Um, so uh, probably everyone here is aware that there are multi many, several different affiliations uh, uh, within the Amish church. Uh, there's the, the, and so in particular, the new order is very, does not impose or is, very, is less likely to impose the collective punishment of shunning on children who leave. The old order is, is somewhat likely to impose that punishment, and the Andy Weaver affiliation definitely will impose that punishment on children who leave. And so what you see here is that the, this punishment is successful, or at least it seems like it's successful, in keeping children in the church. And this, this, this illustrates, you know, the fact that, you need, that this punishment is successful illustrates the, the conflict of interest between the parents and the children. You know, the, you know many children, it's, if you look at the New Order, it seems like many Amish children, you know, a, a non-trivial proportion of Amish children prefer to leave the church if they, if they have the chance. And this punishment of shunning prevents them from leaving the church. At least that's what it looks like if you look at this graph. All right, now let's, let me show you something that, that is probably you know, maybe news to people. I think this is a new result. So this is looking at um, the relationship between parents' wealth and the uh, children's decision to, to leave the church. So on the horizontal, horizontal axis, axis of each of these graphs, I've got uh, parents' wealth, more specifically the logarithm of the value of the parents' home in 1988. And on the vertical axis, I've got the probability that the child from that, that, that home leaves the church. 
And so as you can see, in all of these graphs, there's a negative relationship between parents' wealth and children's propensity to, to leave the church. So the richer the parent is, the less likely the child is to leave the church. Um, if you're a statistician, um, the, this relationship is statistically significant for the, the new order and the old order. Um, it's not statistically significant for the Andy Weaver affiliation, but that's just because so few people leave the Andy Weaver affiliation, it's hard to have to get a good measure of anything related to that. Um, so what I think this, this relationship, again, illustrates is that there's this conflict of interest between the parents and the children. Um, that you know, many children are, you know, would like to leave the church left to their own resources. And the parents, I argue, are using their, the, the parents' resources to, in some cases to prevent children from leaving the church. And the richer parents have more resources, and so they're, it's, it's, it, the, the richer parents are better able to prevent their children from leaving the church. Um, all right, so, so what's the, the kind of, let me conclude and give you some, some thoughts about how this relates to broader issues. So I've argued that in, in, in um, these, what I'm calling pro-family religions, the main conflict that's mediated by religious rules is not the conflict between the self and the community, but rather the conflict between parents and children. So elderly parents want to control their adult children's behavior, and they're going to do that by imposing, they control, the elderly parents have, have political control over the religious community, they're going to control their, their children's behavior by imposing these religious rules. And then they also impose these punishments on children who leave the community in order to, to force or encourage children to remain in the community and follow the rules and behave according to their parents' wishes. Now, finally, you might ask, you know, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and I think it's not so simple. There's a, there's a good aspect and a bad aspect of it. So that what, what's bad about this is that many, or you know, at least some uh, Amish uh, uh, children might feel trapped in the community. Adult children, they might, they, 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 they're forced to remain in this community, even though what's sort of left to their own devices, they would prefer to leave and prefer to do their own thing. Um, so that you might think is, is negative for welfare and causes problems, you know, it, it makes people less well off. But there's also a good aspect. The good aspect is that these rules strengthen family ties. And you might think that left to their own devices, people don't spend enough time with their families. Um, in the larger secular society, there's a big problem with the, de the de declining strength of family ties. Um, there, you know, there are more single parents. Uh, people have fewer children in general. Um, there's more divorce. Um, in, and in general, it seems like family ties are fraying, and that that, that causes you know that that leads to all kinds of social problems. It leads to to, to drug and alcohol dependency. It leads to unhappiness. Um, and so you might think that people need this kind of you, that people are actually, are actually better off if they're forced to be you know closer to their families. If they're if they're required to do more for their families than they would um, left to their own devices. And so in that sense, I think that there may be a lesson for secular society from communities like the Amish. There may, be, there may be a lesson that secular society needs to do more to support families and more to, um, to, to, to make people fulfill their duties to their families than they otherwise would. Um, and so that's what I have to say about the Amish, and I'd be very interested to hear your, your thoughts and your comments.